webinar of uh, the day. This uh, webinar has the title the Multi Device Experience with XR Plus 5G. The presenters are Diego Gonzalez, Alex, and Kevin Pick from Samsung. This webinar will be recorded. If you have any questions, please write inside the chat and they will be answered at the end of this session. Diego and Kevin, are you ready? We are ready. I More than ready. Kevin? Yeah, as always. Okay. So should we start? You can share again. Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, just a final confirmation. Can you see the slides on the screen? No. Uh, currently, Sylvia is a presenter. Okay. Sylvia, please give a ball to Diego. Now, now we see. Okay, great. So let's get uh, started. Uh, good morning. We will be guiding you today to a technology introduction to WebXR. And to do that, we want to start by thinking about the definition of the letter R that is in the same uh, title here. When we think about R, the R stands for reality. And we can start asking ourselves, what is real? Is it about tangible things? Or is it about the interaction that we have with these things? Is it about being surrounded? Or is it about being kind of like immersed into the environment? And possibly the most important question is, can we create an illusion allows us to trick the mind that we can be immersed. There are actually a couple of ways that we could try to do this. Totally. So one of them is, uh, is called VR, which is basically virtual reality, which is basically creating an occlusion of the view of the user. Um, it's usually done by a headset that the users wear on their head. And it's basically creating a world um, around the user. Another one um, is called augmented reality, um, which is um, a bit different in a way that we're more we, we're gonna overlay information on top of the reality. So we're gonna have, um, for example, on the on the side here, we can we can see the size of the branch. We can see uh, where we're gonna cut, and basically just indicating and giving information to the to the user. So, as Kevin has just stated, uh, VR and AR these are just two terms to which we use the term XR as an umbrella term. Uh, depending on who you ask, they might even mention the term MR as mixed reality, as kind of like a mix of uh, this virtual world uh, overlaid in a real environment. But what's important here is to just be clear that the X, we can use it as some sort of variable in algebra, where it could be any type of reality that you want. So in order to dive a bit deeper into this XR is the main reason why we are here. So my name is Diego Gonzalez. I am a product manager for Samsung. And I'm Kevin Picky, a developer advocate for Samsung. And uh, inside of Samsung, we work in the Samsung Internet team. Um, just to give a brief overview of Samsung Internet, uh, it's the company's web browser, and it's the default web browser that comes uh, bundled with every device. Now, you don't have to have a Samsung device to use this web browser because it pretty much runs with any Android device that's running Android L or higher. 
And one of the cool things about the browser is that it's what we call an evergreen browser, which means that it's constantly kept up to date with the greatest and latest web technologies that include, for example, progressive web apps and the one that brings us here today, which is WebXR. Among the tasks that we have as a browser, we're not only involved with the developer community, but we also actively engage with, with uh, web standards. And the technology that we are talking to you today is actually something that we've been actively engaging and working on uh, the implementation and specification uh, to bring it into the browser itself and to the web in general. We also uh, like to have some thought of leadership when it comes to projects and research and see how does the web platform really enable for different scenarios across uh, the world. One of these scenarios that we find extremely interesting to see how we can apply web technologies is when we scope it into the 5G tours project. Now, this is the European project in which we're aiming to test 5G performance in different verticals. For our use cases, we are focusing specifically on tourism. And there are four unique characteristics that we actually have in mind. First of all is the use of XR equipment. Uh, this will pretty much allow us to enable innovative immersive experiences. The second one is uh, that we want this to be a geographically uh, as widespread as possible. Uh, our immersive use cases uh, take part in Athens and in Turin, and it's important that we are making sure that these can be easily uh, distributed and accessed as well. Now, it's geared towards uh, tourists, so you know, adapting to the device that the tourist can have is key if we're talking about a real case scenario. And the other one is how can we take advantage of 5G, uh, allowing for faster connections and showcasing the next generation applications that are powered by a very uh, fast and, and efficient network. So if we take all these points into consideration, what would be the ideal technology stack for this type of project? There are two options when you think about uh, the technology itself. One could be the native approach uh, in which one of the down points is that you have to have an SDK per device, which means that if you want to target phones and VR headsets and AR headsets and even headsets that are of different brands, you need to specifically code and tailor your application for those devices. While the other option is the web option, uh, in which it's based on an open standard and there are several frameworks that hop on top of these. Taking everything that Diego said into consideration, uh, we defined a few characteristics that we uh, that will help us to choose which stack uh, we're going to work on. And from the point of view of the tourist, we decided to make it available on uh, the widest selection of devices. We also wanted something to be uh, accessible and, and technology that is accessible for the most tourists and the most users uh, and the most users. And one of the other key uh, key points is we needed it to be frictionless in the meaning that the acquisition process should be the smoothest as possible. Um, in terms of contact, content, we wanted it to be able to reach the maximum number of people around the world, making it available uh, across different regions and in different languages. We also needed it to be, uh, we also needed a frictionless way of discovering um, and uh, if it, like enabling the content to be distributed and uh, accessed by anyone. Um, and we also decided to work on open text stacks, uh, which will uh, allow us to easily update our project in the, in the future and also to make sure it's well maintained. Um, and as Diego mentioned just before, uh, we are also bringing 5G to all of this, which is going to help us to um, lower our latencies and make sure uh, our users uh, are all connected and synced, and make sure the experience is good for every user. Um, with that in mind, we can also improve the, um, 
the, the assets and offer a bigger world for the user. And by bigger, I also mean better and uh, more beautiful. All of that to improve the experience. This is why we've chosen the web platform. Uh, and I'll let Diego uh, go on. So, oh, sorry, wrong slide. So yes, as Kevin was saying, we chose the web and there's, there's no web without a way of accessing it. And the most common way of accessing the web is through browsers. So we think it's important to talk about the support for WebXR because this definitely spawns across multiple types of um, devices and each device has a different browser that support it. Uh, the bottom line is that even though it's a very new technology, uh, it's already shipping in some of the in some of the um, uh, biggest uh, browsers, and it's uh, behind the flag in other browsers as experimental technology. So uh, it's safe to say that WebXR is now a technology that is getting ready to, uh, for prime time, and these type of use case scenarios are very vital in order to prove the technology itself. Now, uh, support actually goes beyond software and it actually extends to hardware as well. And uh, Kevin will tell us a bit more about the different types of hardware that there are. Totally. Um, as you can see on the side, um, we can see different types of displays. Um, and the first one we think of is the opaque display. The opaque display uh, is, uh, as its name stands, opaque in the meaning that we're not going to see anything and uh, it's totally opaque. It's basically looking at a, uh, at a screen in front of your eyes. Uh, we also have the transparent one, uh, which is commonly used in AR and, um, and uh, mostly used to display information over reality. And we have the latest one here, uh, which is video pass through. And uh, this one is used for Kind of like a magic window to see the world. We also have a few examples of uh, those displays. For example, here, the Samsung Odyssey. Uh, and we can see that it's clearly an opaque, uh, an opaque display, uh, in the meaning that we, once you put that on your head, like, you can't see anything. You're going to be in a, you're going to be transplanted into a different world. Uh, on to the next one, uh, the micro, Microsoft HoloLens 2, uh, which is a transparent display, as you can see uh, on the left side, you can see some kind of visor. Uh, and uh, by putting that on your head, it's going to show additive information uh, to reality. And uh, as I was saying, um, the latest one is uh, simply any phone uh, with the uh, air capabilities. Uh, well, we, we would use this one to, uh, even if we don't have a display or uh, an expensive headset, uh, we could uh, and, and experience those experiences. But and, that's not the only type of hardware that is out there, because if we consider not the type of display, as Kevin was mentioning, but the type of tracking, then we see that there's a whole different category. And we can start by the magic window, uh, the ones that are, that are based on AR Core and AR Kit, which pretty much are defined by, let's say, devices that would use their uh, gyroscope in order to position uh, the, to the virtual world. Then we have the ones that are generally referred to as three DOF or degrees of freedom, uh, which would be devices in which we know uh, what's orientation. So we're talking about yaw, pitch, and roll. Uh, and this could be applied either to the headset or to the controller. And then we have the ones that are uh, the, mo the more complex ones, which are the six degrees of freedom, which uh, can allow us to know orientation and position. So apart from knowing yaw, pitch, and roll, we also know the X, Y, and Z, the position in space of these headsets. So to give uh, some examples as well, we have, uh, this is a device that is powered by the phone. It's generally considered a zero degrees of freedom uh, because we, have, we hold it to our heads and then depending on where we're looking at, we get um, the phone uh, reacting based on the orientation sensors. This is a three degrees of freedom device. 
uh, and the three degrees of freedom apply in this case, both for the controller that you hold in the hand and for the headset itself. Um, these allow us to know the orientation of both the head and the hand on which you're holding the controller. And uh, we go then to devices like the Oculus Rift S, which is a six degrees of freedom device. Uh, in this case, you see that there are two controllers and the headset, and for both controllers and the headset, you can know the orientation. So where are you looking and how are you moving? Uh, and also the position, where in space are you um, in relation with the origin? And uh, in a similar way, as Kevin ended the previous classification of devices, it's always important to provide, it's always important to provide some level of experience even if you don't have a headset. So uh, just with a regular phone, you will be able to hop into the experience and look around through something that would look more or less like a window. So you can see that uh, trying to cater an experience for each single type of variation of device that we have just shown can be quite daunting. And this is something that actually brings us back to the concept of WebXR. Um, and I would like to formally introduce WebXR as a specification that describes support for accessing virtual and augmented reality devices. And these include sensors and head-mounted displays on the web. So to summarize it, um, WebXR is a technology in the browser that once you connect a VR headset, you can get the position and orientation if it's actually uh, supported by the browser. And one of the things that we actually see as beneficial is that this is just one small piece of the web platform. And this kind of opens a kind of like puzzle-like toolbox that allows mix and matching with other web technologies. Because while WebXR gives us the orientation and the position of the connected VR or AR hardware, you still need to draw this into the screen and present the images. And this is going to be done generally by WebGL or WebGL2 or WebGPU or some other uh, rendering uh, technology that will be available in the future. If you want to present spatial audio, then you most likely will be using the uh, audio panning nodes of the web audio API. If you want to make sure that this experience works offline and that it's available as a, an application on your home screen, then you might want to make it a progressive web app. And we can go on and forth with every single web technology. So this is just to say that you're gaining a lot of other benefits that are already associated with the web platform as a whole. So, how do you actually get um, started with uh, WebXR? Once you have a browser, you will um, you can query these values, and they're pretty much exposed by the XR interface. So you can see in the screenshot that we have a browser, um, we have the developer tools, and we open the console. So what's uh, relevant here is to notice that once we query for navigator.xr, we are getting a list of methods that are exposed through this interface. And the one that we are interested in here uh, is, first of all, uh, the support session mode, which uh, we can see um, over here, pointed by the arrow, um, and the request session. So navigator.xr is an entry point the API, it will allow us to query XR features. And these XR features are actually related to the type of uh, display, the type of headsets that Kevin was talking about before when he mentioned opaque, uh, transparent. Um, it will initiate as well the communication with the XR hardware. And of course, you have a list of XR devices because if you're testing WebXR on, on a computer or a more or powerful device, you might see that there might be more, more than one headset connected. So once you want to start running WebXR, the first thing is to check if the type of session that you want is supported. And this is uh, pretty much represented by the XR session mode, which could be one of three. It could be an inline session, which would mean that the XR experience it's running inside a web page, meaning that you still can see the web page and you will get the experience as if it were some sort of diorama, where uh, depending on how you move the device 
uh, if it's, for example, a phone, then the little box is actually uh, responding in real time to the type of uh, movement. You have then the immersive VR, which is the one that we are actually using for uh, 5G tours, in which the immersive environment surrounds you and you can actually put on a headset and you are inside the experience. And uh, with the development of the uh, WebSAR AR module, then you can enable the immersive AR one in which uh, you get uh, an, an immersive uh, environment. Once you check if the browser and the hardware support the session, then what you need to do is you, you advertise this to the user. And generally the way that this is being done is by showing a button on the lower right corner of the screen, just like the one that's on this slide, that has some sort of sh uh, goggles shape. So this tells the user that if they click or if they tap on that button, they will be transported into the VR uh, or AR experience. And this is important because we want to wait for this uh, user activation event in order to preserve uh, privacy and security. You probably don't want your device to go right into XR mode uh, unless you actually explicitly ask for it. And then um, once you have the activation event, you can request the session. And if this request succeeds, then you run the frame loop. And the frame loop is just the one in which you uh, pull the information from the sensors, so position and orientation of the controllers uh, and the headset. Uh, you can query any other environmental uh, variables that you have, and then you draw, uh, you generate the image accordingly. So you would set the cameras uh, to where the user is uh, looking. You would set the 3D models for hands if you have uh, 3D models for hands to where the user is positioning them, orientating them, uh, and you keep this frame loop running until the user decides to leave the application. But there are ways that you can abstract this to make it even easier to work with because you might not want to be accessing all the time uh, the WebXR uh, API. Exactly. So this is why it brings up the question of how do we develop in practice? Um, and we got a few answers for that. and. Um, uh, as you can see on the screen, we uh, selected a few frameworks and libraries. Um, so we got 3GS, A-Frame, and BabylonJS. Those are, to my knowledge, the most common news and the most famous ones out here. Um, if we look at 3GS, it has uh, a few characteristics uh, that I'd like to note. For example, uh, there's no integrated physics to it. Uh, which is going to be make which is going to be making us the job harder, uh, and it is also closer to metal, uh, which uh, will help us a lot to create shaders. And uh, and yeah, if we look at a frame, um, a frame is more high level, and um, it's as high level as you can even uh, create an experience only by using HTML. It also works in JavaScript. And uh, there's an important thing to note about Ephraim. Um, it's that it's uh, based of uh, 3GS. And um, the latest one here that I'm going to talk about and a bit more later uh, is BabylonGS. I would say Babylon is kind of in the middle of the two, uh, where um, it has integrated physics and it's a bit easier to use. and um, uh, Kinda uh, in the in the middle level of uh, of uh, middle, yes. <laughs> and uh, this is why we've chosen to work uh, with Babylon JS, and uh, how we've decided to work um, on the 5G tour experiences that we are doing. So uh, a few other things about Babylon JS, um, just to recap. Um, Babylon JS is a 3D engine. Uh, we Develop with it in JavaScript uh, and TypeScript also, but we're going to be using uh, JavaScript. And it's also an open source project. And uh, this is also something that's very important for us uh, in terms of maintainability and uh, allowing us to um, um, work on the project and uh, uh, improve it. In terms of uh, development environment, uh, this is a uh, 
basic web uh, development environment, I'd say. Um, we're using VS Code for the JavaScript part. Uh, we're going to be using the browser to test the experience. And we're also using um, something that's not yet included in the browsers. But um, it is a WebXR API emulator, which is going to make us uh, work on the WebXR experience uh, way easier by allowing us to select the device that we want to emulate. Um, as you can see here, um, we can see the browser uh, with our VR experience. Uh, we also have here the, the emulator that I was talking about. And um, as you can see, you can you can select the headset and even uh, rotate it and uh, have the information on the coordinates. And uh, finally, the, the VS Code uh, with uh, some example of code that's only running JavaScript. Um, one of the key things uh, about our project is that it's, uh, it has to be multi-device. Uh, in other way, in, uh, in a simple word, uh, multiplayer. Uh, for that, we needed uh, some kind of network communication between, um, between each devices. We needed to communicate position, orientation, and other information between a server and um, the headset or the devices of the users. And um, we decided, uh, as we decided to work on, uh, on the web platform, uh, we decided to use uh, with uh, web sockets. Here is an example of, uh, of a connection. Uh, here you can see Diego with his um, XR device. Uh, we can see a server on the side, and uh, we can see all the users uh, on the bottom. Uh, by all the users, I mean Diego and everyone else. Uh, so, as you can see, the arrow is uh, showing us that Diego is sending the server his position and the orientation, and the server is going to retransmit those information to all of the users uh, with the details of all the users, so that we can appropriately um, update the, um, uh, the position and the orientation of each uh, user. Um, and we have a, a quick demo here. Um, showing uh, so that I can show you how our work uh, works in practice. So I'm going to be sharing my screen. Yes, I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, going to you, Kevin, then. Perfect. Okay, I can confirm that we see your desktop. Perfect, and I'm, I'm muted. Perfect. So as you can see here on the screen, uh, on the on the highest part of the screen on the top, we can see an uh, an experience uh, running on the on the left, um, and uh, it is a, a 3D room. We can also see another one uh, on the lower side, which is uh, basically another user. And we also have on the right side the different emulators that uh, will allow us to to move the views. So let's say the first user at the top decides to move his head around to experience the, the the room. We can see that the other user at the bottom is able to see the other user rotating his head, and uh, if he was moving, we could see him moving around the room. As you can see, this room uh, uh, is uh, very simple, and uh, in the ideal goal of our project, uh, we're going to be uh, working with models of uh, museums so that the room is going to be bigger and, uh, and, uh, and more enjoyable. And uh, this also works um, uh, on the bottom view for the other users. Uh, let me make them look at it themselves with their funny glasses. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we can basically see them uh, rotating around, moving. We can even make them look somewhere else. And uh, yeah, we basically see them move around. 
So I just want to mention that the the room we see here is a it is an open uh, poly, uh, an open uh, an open model that's been downloaded from uh, Google Poly. Uh, and uh, we can see on the ground here, uh, probably some of you will uh, recognize her. Uh, it is Mertis. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, quick shout out to her. Um, <clears throat> so if I go back to the presentation, uh, Diego, you wanted to add something? Uh, um, no, it actually looks good. I mean, we can see both headsets, how they're reacting and how uh, eventually a fast connection is needed in order to keep the latency low, especially if there's going to be interaction. Um, so, yeah, great. Okay. Um, yeah, we have uh, questions and answers, although I believe that uh, uh, Sylvia um, might be moderating that. So... <coughs> Uh, in oh, the meantime. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Diego and Kevin, for this nice presentation and uh, eager to use uh, these XR, XR multi devices. So, yes, we have uh, two questions, and please all write questions in the chat. There is the first question, 5G would struggle hugely with door coverage, especially for the high performance version. Indoor access will likely need the Wi-Fi, especially Wi-Fi 6E. How is this being addressed? Um, yes. Well, in, in this case, um, we are pretty much in charge of the net uh, of the uh, application side. Um, let's say that from our point of view, the assets and the experience itself will be as optimized uh, by using um, different web technologies. And and this is kind of like tricky because if if we wanted to create this in a way that could be completely optimized, then we would be using um, caching, and uh, we would make sure that the first time that uh, the user loads certain assets, we are trying to uh, cache them into the browser, so the next time they go in, they're already loading from the uh, device's memory. Um, there are ways that we can do this with, for example, progressive web apps, but from, from the indoor network perspective, that's kind of like a bit outside of, of our area of expertise. Um, at the moment, we are actually testing uh, in, in our uh, places with uh, Wi-Fi uh, and thinking if we have very bad, um, kind of like we had some sort of network throttling. But at least let's say that the network infrastructure is kind of like independent for us as web developers and we are just trying to optimize as much as uh, we can both with caching and, and other technologies uh, having said that there uh, is um, another part of the samsung team that is actually experts on networks and i'm pretty sure that they are more than capable of, of addressing uh, this question there is a question on cross device uh, synchronization is this aspect uh, important for your use case? Is, is it essential? Does the WebXR support any native feature to guarantee this? So I'll I'll let um, Kevin answer. How is it that they are uh, that he is uh, playing with the thinking? But I just want to state that WebXR as a whole does not have any, let's say, native feature because um, what WebXR does is only take uh, and record to the browser the position and the orientation of, of the headset. So it gives you access to those positions and there are other mechanisms in the browser with other web technologies to actually guarantee this. So uh, maybe Kevin, you can speak a bit about uh, how you're actually doing um, the, the multiplayer interaction. So yeah, so about the multiplayer interaction, um, so, so there's no really way we can guarantee it in terms of WebXR support. But um, what we have is uh, both of the users are in the same world and have the same coordinates and are in the same 3D space. 
So the 0, the 0, the 0 will be at the same place for the same for the both of the users. And um, putting the two users in different coordinate and um, updating at a at a at a regular uh, rate uh, make the experience uh, smooth. There is a question on the refresh rate for sharing the position and the orientation from client to server, which is and how this affect the experience. Yes, yeah, totally. So, I, I, you you got. Yeah. Um. Uh. Just I, I guess quickly, in VR generally the the magic number is keep it under 20 uh, milliseconds, uh, what's called uh, motion to photon. So basically, in order to not break the experience of immersion, uh, you have to be fairly quick from when you move to when uh, the image gets displayed on, on your headset. Um, if we're talking about a local environment, this is fairly easy to achieve, and actually technology already does it. Uh, there's definitely a complexity uh, that is added by when we want to do this in a multiplayer environment. Um, in previous examples that we actually did uh, a couple of years ago, uh, that we were using earlier versions of the specification over uh, 4G network, uh, you could definitely sense the uh, the lag, and and it could be something that is very disturbing for the user, and that's why we are we are actually uh, part of the the thing that we want to test with this use case is um, what would be the benefits of doing a, a, a new type of experience um, enabled by 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 the fee, by the 5G uh, network. Sylvia, I'm not sure. Yeah, if you want to add something, Kevin. So, yeah, just want to. It's, it's not about this question. About the the question about the 5G uh, coverage. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, clarify that, that you know for. Uh, for the WebXR team, of course, they are they work on the application, so they are ag agnostic to the uh, to the network. But I, I just wanted to highlight that for the uh, for the Italian node, uh, this is already expected in the use case because some of the use cases are in uh, Palazzo Madama. Sometimes they are even in in places like in the underground or in in rooms that are of difficult access to uh, 5G. And uh, I just wanted to say that it's not only one 5G coverage that is used. Uh, there are a lot of uh, types of coverage that are expected in different use cases. Some of them use Wi-Fi. Some of them use uh, smaller networks. So this is how uh, this is being addressed in the uh, specific use cases. It's not uh, like one 5G uh, uh, large cell that addresses everything. Thank you, Bella, for this clarification. Uh, there is a final question. What's the state of award anchors in the specification across the different vectors? HoloLens has uh, two Samsung phones with that sensor and iPad. So I believe that is being discussed in the um, that is being discussed in the AR module um, of of um of the immersive web working group um to be completely honest i am not sure on what is the latest um uh, the latest on on uh, the anchors in these specifications um i'm not sure if they made it to uh, the new charter um but uh that's fairly easy for me to ask and i'll definitely get back to you fabian <laughs> Is there any other questions? Please write in the chat. We have still a few minutes left. I remind all that uh, the WebEx session is recorded inside our website and you can access it. You can follow us on our website, Twitter and LinkedIn. If you are interested to 
ask more aspects uh, to Diego and Kevin, uh, you can uh, contact uh, uh, directly them or contact uh, through the contact uh, address of our uh, 5G tools. I think that there are no more questions. Thanks, Diego and Kevin, for this uh, nice presentation. And uh, thank you all for, the, for participating in these uh, webinars. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye. Bye.